well, first of all, I just love skiing, like, so much. There's nothing in the world that brings me more joy, ever. Yeah, I'm scared to death right now, but I've got this. Like, I know deep down inside, I'm capable of what I'm about to do. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Athletic Stance Podcast, a skier's perspective with your host, yours truly, Scott Chrisman. In this podcast, I have made it my job to go out and interview skiers at the highest level of the sport, to explore their perspective on life, what shaped and influenced them to become the person they are, and a whole lot more. First, let's take a look at our sponsors, because without them, none of this is possible. Our first sponsor is Northwest Tech. If you haven't heard of them yet, you're missing out. They hand bank customizable three-layer outerwear to order in the Pacific Northwest, and that means you know that it keeps you warm, dry, and looking unique while you're sending it around the mountain. They've been generous enough to give me a coupon code for my listeners. Use the code AOS75 to get $75 off any custom piece of outerwear. Their site is in the show notes. Our second sponsor is Organifi. Organifi makes organic superfood drinks, proteins, and supplements. These guys are awesome. Their product is top notch and keeps me healthy and happy throughout the entire season. Use the code AOS for 15% off over and above any other sale that they're having their site is in the show notes as well check them out shit this was one of the most fun insightful just inspiring conversations that i've had so far and i i can't tell you how lucky i am to be able to have watched this guy in movies growing up and to be able to have skied with him in chile and to have continued to form a relationship with him he really needs no introduction without further ado Ian McIntosh. So, my name is Ian McIntosh. I grew up in a small town called Invermere, BC, Canada. I uh, now live in the Whistler area of BC. And uh, my background in skiing, I mean, I was a ski racer when I was young and really just didn't like the structured environment and I wanted to ski Palomar. My dad was a um, pretty avid ski tourer, so was my mom, and they got me out ski touring at a really young age. Like eight years old, I had my own touring set up. And um, yeah, I just I just decided that I wanted to ski powder all the time. I didn't really have any sort of, uh, you know, goals beyond that. And uh, yeah, it kind of t- morphed into I wanted to be a guide for a little bit, and then um, I ended up just kind of living the eternal winter thing, um, and I wanted to go to New Zealand, so I went to New Zealand, and uh, when I was in New Zealand, I met up with a bunch of guys from Whistler, and they kind of convinced me to move out to Whistler and pursue the, the pro skier life. Um, I guess they saw some potential in me or whatever. And, uh, yeah, I moved out to Whistler. I was, you know, I was kind of growing up in the Kootenays in BC. I was a bit of a Whistler hater, um, as you are. I mean, grew up in the interior. But uh, 
moved out here and grew to love the place and started to kind of pursue things, filming with small, like, local film companies and then uh, got into working with um, some other friends on, on kind of pursuing the whole comp scene and did a couple of years of, you know, I would do good and then I would eventually explode. I was going way too hard and big and, um, you know, I'd be like, getting into the finals in a good position and then I get way too excited and explode, but started to figure out the recipe that you kind of need to ski at 80% or so in those comps and did well for a couple of years. And then, uh, yeah, eventually got the opportunity to film a TGR and yeah, 12 years later, I think it's been still filming with those guys. Oh uh, yeah. And it's been, a, an amazing journey to watch you through those movies. That's for sure. Um, I think your first film segment, if I don't, I don't want to speak, uh, to something that I don't know, but when we hung out in Chile, uh, I think you told me that you had to borrow money from your parents or from someone and go into debt for that first film trip. Um, my first year with TGR, um, they basically just said, hey, come on down to Jackson and you can do your like, you can do a season of trial run in Jackson with us and sleep on a couch and so on and so forth. And, and I basically went down there with no money, but with a credit card that had like a $6,000 limit. And okay. I just met. I remember when I was going home or trying to go home at the end of that three months in Jackson, my credit card was maxed and uh, I, my girlfriend at the time had to wire me some money so that I could get home. And then I got home and, uh, you know, got back onto the construction train for that fall and also delivering pizzas for Domino's. So, you know, some days I'd work 18 hours, but I'd make like 500 bucks in a day and uh, pull myself out of debt pretty quick with that program. Yeah. determined you are like spending time with you in chile i found out a lot about how much determination and how much just like passion for life you have and uh is there like anything that you attribute it to do you just wake up in the morning and get stoked for life or um is there like do you have uh where does the energy come from for you um i it's a good question um I guess, you know, part of it would be like my upbringing. My parents are very active people. My whole family is super active. And, you know, my upbringing was very much um, in that kind of realm. You know, I mean, my brother, for instance, that I grew up with is also a very determined person. Um, and everyone in my family, for that matter, uh, you know, he's got a different p path than I did. But... Um, I think we're just, you know, we were taught hard work at a young age, and um, I have a lot of passion for skiing, um, yep. and even though I'm a very hard worker when I do work, I, I really wanted to find a way to make my passion my job, and I was more focused at working hard at that than, um, than trying to find, find some sort of other career path, and so I guess, you know, I really just didn't leave myself any other option. Uh, I was a ski bomb. I, you know, I was broke in my early 20s. I didn't have, you know, a college degree or anything like that to fall back on. Um, you know, I was learning carpentry at the time, um, but I, I was not a journeyman by any means. And I was just determined that, like, you know what, skiing is what's going to, you know, get me to where I want to be in life. And, uh, and you know, when you don't really give yourself any other option, I guess you uh, just kind of make it happen. Yeah, totally. Put the pressure on and you, you have to perform or, you know, there's really no other option. <clears throat> yeah, you know, I just, I never really ever told myself that it wasn't possible. I just, I just decided that this is what I was going to do. And no matter what, I was going to figure out a way. And, you know, that doesn't work for everybody. Um, I, you know, I could, I'm not going to sit here and tell everyone like, hey, follow your dreams and for sure it'll happen, you know. But it's not going to happen for everyone. I was fortunate it happened to me, for me. Um, you know, a lot of 
you know, lucky things happen along the way to make that all come together. But, you know, what I would say to anyone else is that, you know, if you do follow your passion and you do follow your dreams, that no matter what, you're going to be a happy person and you're going to develop certain skills in life and you're going to be doing what you want to be doing with your life. And, you know, you might never make a lot of money or anything, but at least you'll be a happy person and, uh, and you'll, you know, you'll be doing exactly what you want to be doing instead of stuck in some career path or job that, that uh, you despise, but you only do just to pay bills, um, you know, and, there, and then therefore go out and buy things that, you know, lock you into that job and, and almost make you a slave to that job. So, yeah, for, for me, it was I was lucky. You know, there's a lot of skilled skiers out there. There's a lot of amazing skiers out there. I think I had something different to offer the industry. Um, you know, I, I was a very hard-charging personality. I'm, you know, I'm a redhead. I'm fiery. And, uh, and uh, I, I kind of take that approach to my skiing. There's, it's not there's nothing really fancy about what I do on my skis. There's, you know, it's kind of no frills. It's just, it's you know, I kind of... I had this niche for doing the the scary crap, you know that that uh, that most people don't really um, look at as fun. But for me, that's where I was having a lot of fun within the sport, and and therefore it became like kind of my niche that uh, you know those scary, super committed, uh, don't f up lines were were the thing for me. So yeah, totally. Um... Yeah, you kind of you said something where you know it might not work out for everyone, but uh, just my two cents on that is like you're not gonna take what ifs to the grave, and that's something that's you know I think taking the what ifs to the grave uh, can be really detrimental for people, you know. Where if you, I agree one hundred percent. Like I don't think in life that you should ever have regret, and. If there's a what if, that's that's regret, you know. That's a regret of not giving it a shot because you, you never knew, you know, if it was possible. And, and, you know, another example of what I've done with my life, um, you know, I always had a dream of flying and I always had a dream of, of human flight and the pursuit of wingsuit base jumping was something that I went for. And, and I lived that dream. And... You know, I scratched that. I can grow old and know, looking back, that you know what I didn't. I didn't let that go. You know, that itch go unscratched. I, I wanted to do something. Um, I wanted to experience it, and I went for it. I I learned how to do it, and I went out and I experienced it. Now I'm not really much anymore because you know, I didn't really like a lot of the things I saw in the sport, uh, and I didn't really trust myself to. Um, to have a long life within that sport. I'm, I think I, I was taking risks beyond my ability uh, within that sport. And, and that's just kind of a character of, of, or my character, I guess, is that, you know, I'm not a very, I, you know, I'm, I guess I'm a ballsy person. So, you know, I was, I was stuff beyond my ability, but I, I, I figured it out like, Hey, you know what? I gotta, I gotta back away from the sport. You know what? I scratched that itch. I lived that dream. I can grow old knowing that, like, hey, you know what? That was something I dreamt of doing, and I went out and did it. And, yeah, I never became pro, and I never became the best at it, which, you know, I did have, you know, thoughts of, like, hey, I could be, like, one of these guys flying, like, the gnarliest lines. But that's – I'm totally okay with that because I, I experienced it, and I went out and I lived it, you know. And that's that's the one thing I really want to try and pass on to people that, that – uh, you know, kind of pick my brain on, on, you know, life and, and so on and so forth and how I approach it. So, yeah, totally. I just got into speed flying. So I wanted to talk to you about your, your base jumping and wing suiting and all that. So I'm, I'm super glad that you, you brought that up. Have you ever done anything like speed flying? I've done a few speed fly flights and I'm looking to do more. That's kind of, you know, for me, that's more of an easy blend between skiing and flying and uh and i f i feel like you can you know you can keep it more mellow um just on like a f on like a baseline yep. you know like just going out to do a wingsuit base jump versus just going out to do a speed fly flight i feel like the speed fly flights much safer activity 
Now, mind you, you can get as gnarly as you want with both those activities, but just on a baseline, I feel like speed flying is a little bit more uh, safe. And, and yeah, like I said, it speaks to me a little bit more these days uh, just because it is a, a great blend for the two sports. So I'm excited to do more of it for sure. So how do you deal with fear? Uh, like base jumping is super scary. Uh, wing suiting is super scary. The stuff that you do on skis, it's, you know, it, like you said, it's, uh, it's fully committed lines. So how do you deal with fear? Is there like a mantra that you say to yourself? Is there a way you get yourself hyped up? Um, like how do you, how do you manage that? Um, well, I, th I think for me is I, I kind of use the fear to channel the energy into positivity. Yeah. You know, if you're standing at the top of a line or on the edge of a cliff about to jump or whatever it may be and, and you're thinking negative thoughts, uh, you're probably going to fuck it up. But if, you know, if you can find a way to be positive and use that fear and channel that fear to keep you safe and like listen to your gut and use the fear to listen to your gut, then um, then you find yourself in this place where you're like, you know, you might be on top of something super scary. Like, yeah, I'm scared to death right now, but I've got this. Like, I know deep down inside I'm capable of what I'm about to do. And so in that respect, um, I kind of use it to fuel the fire and use it to, you know, to, to channel um, my mindset and to focus and, you know, ultimately fear keeps you safe um, and, and I deal with it and I manage it. But, you know, there's a saying that goes like doubt kills more dreams than failure ever will. And so don't, you know, don't doubt yourself, you know, and if, as long as you're picking the right places to, to figure out what failure is all about, then everything else kind of falls into place and. And, you know, like I say, I just kind of use fear to, to channel my, my energy into, into a really focused state. And then uh, you, you kind of get rewarded um, when you pull it off. Yeah, totally. There's a, a sense of accomplishment and like, uh, yeah, like, yeah, anytime you push past your comfort zone, but you successfully manage the fear and, and successfully manage the, the risks and then you're standing at the bottom you know, I think that's one of the feelings that we live for in skiing or, you know, in any of those extreme sports. It's like uh, overcoming those limits that potentially would keep a lot of people away from doing what we do. Right. No, that's, that's kind of like the cliche thing, right? It's, it's like that's, that's truly living and that's like being in the moment and that's what we strive for. Um, uh, you know, it's... In life, you know, there's so much shit going on in our brains in day-to-day -day life. You know, the inner voice is just going off and you have to worry about, you know, your bills and, you know, a multitude of all, the, all of these other things, your career, relationships, and so much in our lives. And, you know, it's kind of it's kind of getting back to that more animalistic state of mind, you know, where you're just living nothing. That's for men to live is just the moment, you know, when you, when you look at, um, like a dog, for instance, I've got a fresh dog here with me, um, you know, they, they don't, they're not thinking about past or future or worrying about anything that's the moment. And that's what we stand for, I think, as, as, you know, action sports athletes or whatever you want to call it, you know, it's, it's just being in that moment as cliche as it is, it's, it's, uh, it's the most beautiful state of mind to, to find on in this life. Yeah, totally. Um, do you have any like morning or evening routines that you do on a daily basis? It's hard for, you know, when you're traveling so much and when you're dealing, um, you know, with flights or hotels or stuff like that. But there is there a uh, like a morning or evening routine that you try and stick to? Um, well, when I'm home is when my morning routine is dialed. Um, and you know, that's, you know, that's like, you know, making an amazing smoothie, uh, to start my day and, you know, focusing on nutrition 
and um, and then you know obviously making sure I get out for some some exercise and and sorts of things. When I'm on the road, my routine falls apart a little bit, and it definitely depends on what I'm doing. You know, um, sometimes you're on a road and you're on a film trip, and and so you know you might wake up and, and start your day with a stretch and and um, try and you know find that you know focus kind of zen state of mind before your day your hectic day begins or or whatever it may be but uh yeah home is when my my program is dialed and on the road it's it's tough for sure you talked about the inner voice do you want do any uh sort of meditation yeah for sure um i i definitely try and you know get into a quiet meditative state from time to time, especially when there's something, um, you know, big on the horizon or I'm making big plans. Um, I was fortunate last year at the North Face Athlete Summit, we had Wim Hof, the Iceman, yep. came mm-hmm. and met with us and and taught us some great things about breathing techniques and, and so on and so forth. And I actually used that um, when we were climbing Denali earlier this summer. And... Uh, and I feel like it helps for sure. Yeah, totally. Angel yeah. talked about Wim Hof breathing in our in our interview as well, and uh, yeah. I think he has some really powerful techniques. And obviously, you know, he's accomplished some amazing things, some superhuman things himself. So to be able to learn from him, that must have been really cool. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's it's cool to learn from someone like that, and and you know when when all the study and the science behind what he's doing is real, you know, you can, it, it just makes it that much easier to buy into it. Cause you know, you almost feel silly at first. Um, you know, when, when he's teaching you his techniques, cause it's really just breathe motherfucker, breathe as <laughs> Wim Hof. But, um, it, it, there is a lot of science like they've studied him and it's pretty amazing what, uh, what just breathing will do, you know, I think as humans, we, we focus on a lot of different aspects of our health. Um, and we kind of forget about the one thing that we're doing all, all the time, which is breathing and, uh, and how much healthier we would all be if we just, you know, put a little bit more oxygen into our bloodstream from time to time. Yeah, totally. It's, (laughs) and how, and how that would help us like achieve, you know, things that, that, uh, you know, we might not otherwise be able to achieve so yeah man totally it's uh it's one of those things where you have the option to have your body do it or you get to do it like your heart will beat whether you you know whether you like it or not your heart's gonna beat and yeah you know food's gonna digest but that's the one thing that you have the option to be conscious of or not and when you are conscious of it I feel like it just leads to these, uh, these like almost like slower moments, like where you get to perceive more, and um, just overall, it just seems to be a. Uh, I don't know. For me, it's something that I try and spend as much time as I possibly can consciously breathing, and it's easy to forget about and easy to be like, oh, I mean, I did that, or but you know, the more that I actually get to consciously breathe it it ends up being something that really I find empowers me. So, yeah, no, for sure. And I mean, you know, one of the things I learned through Wim Hof and Stanford university studied him on this is through like a 20 minute breathing session, like being in a relaxed state and, and breathing, um, with his like method, it, you can go from an acidic body to alkaline and, you know, Alkaline's like non-cancerous, like 100% healthy. You're going to perform better. You're going to be able to do, you know, superhuman things when you have an alkaline uh, body. But when you're acidic, you're, you know, you're basically cancerous and, and, um, and you're not going to be able to perform at your best. So there's a lot to be said for it, for sure. Definitely. And, you know, like oxidative stress is really the cause of all disease which is you know being uh that being acidic and oxidative stress kind of go hand in hand because your cells aren't operating the way that they should be and uh yeah yeah it's uh no for sure i mean you know like 
41 percent of americans get cancer in their lives this is a real problem you know and it's and we got to start asking ourselves why and i mean a big part of it is diet for sure but um there's other things too that we can do to combat some of the some of the unhealthy aspects of our lives and and breathing is 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 a big one because you know if you can if you can find a way to get your body alkaline more often um you're you know you're going to be a much healthier person so yeah your body is going to um stay in in symbiosis and you know be uh be exactly how it it wants to be and it always is trying to get back towards homeostasis but um yeah it just, that's like something that really really is beneficial and something that more people could pay attention to i think yeah i mean like cancer cells thrive off of sugar and a deoxygenated environment you know and um so you know cutting down on sugar and breathing more often or you know meditating and while you meditate uh breathing a lot um you know you can you can really basically set yourself up for a long healthy life yeah totally speaking of and perform and yeah. perform so Totally. Speaking of nutrition, is there any sort of, you know, regimen that you stick to? Obviously, I think you probably limit sugar, but is there any sort of, uh, like, diet that you stick to? Or, um, you know, it's hard on the road, like, to get, like, when you're in the airport, it's hard to get fresh, local, locally sourced foods. But when you're at home, is there uh, something that you're looking for? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm um, I'm a big advocate of, of eating local or as local as you can you know when you're in the grocery store it's like you've got two options there's you know an apple from bc where i live or there's one from new zealand i'm going to pick the bc apple you know um and then i can get that down to even you know especially in the summertime around here much more local and when i'm living in pemberton i have my garden there and uh and a lot of local farmers that i know that um you know, you can really get down to a, to a, you know, a couple mile diet, um, in the summertime. And then, you know, not only is it great for your health, but, but also for the environment. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I've, you know, I'm still, I'm still a meat eater, but my fiance, I hate that word, but, uh, she's, she's a vegetarian and, um, you know, I definitely eat a lot less meat in my life these days. Um, and, and another th- thing that's not only great for me, but it's great for the environment. Yep. Uh, you know, like the beef industry is probably the single worst thing for the environment uh, on planet Earth. And so, you know, cutting back on those sorts of things, you know, like tonight I'm cooking, uh, you know, a beautiful, a glory bowl, which is basically like quinoa, spinach, um, carrots, beets, avocado, um, and some tofu, grilled tofu. And then with like a nice, like, um, super healthy, uh, nutritional yeast kind of based sauce, you know? And so it's, you know, like eating like that is, like I say, it's not only good for you, it's good for the environment. And there's, you know, a lot of meat eaters and I'm a meat eater and people get so defensive about Mm -hmm. when, when you talk to them about eating less meat, uh, because they love it. Um, but a lot of them will first, the first thing they'll say is you're not going to eat enough protein. And it's, it's such bullshit. Totally. To, uh, you know, you can get so much protein out of lentils and, and chickpeas and, and, and all sorts of different plant-based foods, uh, beans and, and everything. Like there's, there's so many other ways to get, um, all the protein you need in your diet. And, and don't get me wrong. I still eat meat from time to time. You know, I still love eggs and, um, and certain things, but, but I definitely try and cut back on that sort of stuff. And and like I say, I start my morning off with like a smoothie that's just jam full of like, you know, leafy greens and veggies and tons of different fruit and hemp hearts and chia seeds and ginger and turmeric and you got to put a bit of pepper in there so your body absorbs the turmeric yep. and you know the list goes on but like you know that's how I start my day and um and you know not only are you are you healthier and are, is the planet healthier 
but you're, you can perform better and you feel better when you're performing. And so, and not to mention like, you know, when I, when I do get on the road, like say I go to Europe and stuff, and we start getting back on the cheese and meat program. It's like, you know, my, my internal system, my digestive system, you can just tell it just doesn't react well. You know, you just, you have these super unsatisfactory poos, you know? <laughs> right. and like, and then I get home and I get back on my program and it's just like, it's like the most satisfying, you know, digestive system in the world. It's just, everything's just working as it should. And, uh, and that's, you know, that's, you know, I encourage everyone. I do a lot of talks for protect our winners at schools and stuff. And, and then the number one thing I try and tell kids is like, listen, you know, you can do more for the environment through your diet than, you know, anything else in yeah. your life. And so try and eat more local and eat less meat. And right there, you're going to be doing, you know, so much more for the environment than like, you know, if your parents drive an electric car or whatever it may be, you know, it's like that right there is the single biggest impact we can have as humans. And, uh, I think most people don't think of that. You know, they, 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 they think they got to go drive a hybrid or something to be an environmentalist or, and, and that's kind of missing the point. Yeah, totally. Or put solar on their house, or yeah, whatever, yeah. whatever it all is. Great, like it all adds for sure. But you know, diets where it all begins. It's you know, it's about having a healthier life and a healthier planet. Um, you know, I mean, we need it. We're you know, our planet's in in uh, in a bad state right now, and we need to change the way we all live. And and our consumption of meat is is way too high for that to be sustainable for the next hundred years so yeah totally and uh it's something that you know i think one of my missions in life is being you know being in the uh in the mountains you get to see these beautiful places and then you know even in the in the last like 15 years of my life seeing glaciers that i you know have skied shrinking and you know seeing everything that's happening um you know, I think we, yeah, we're definitely on a path that is scary. It's scary to think what our children's children's children are going to have to deal with if they can even, you know, if they have the ability to uh, exist in the world. And so, you know, one of my missions is to kind of, you know, to ask people like you and to ask, you know, um, to figure out the the day to day things that we can do to help the environment. So I love how you just jumped right on that. And, uh, no, for sure, man. And, and like, you know, listen, I, I, I honestly feel like a lot of, of the issues that we have are going to get solved through technology mm -hmm. and, and, and it won't be forced. It'll just like clean energy is becoming so cheap that it's just going to be the way that everyone goes because why would we still burn fossil fuels when solar is cheaper and wind's cheaper and all these things are cheaper. That's going to be a natural progression. But the other, the flip side, like we're talking about, is diet. And you know, when you look at like the agricultural industry, 50% of the landmass on planet Earth that we use for agricultural is for cows. Yeah. And not only is that landmass being used for cows, but their their crap is getting into our water supply, which is flushing out to the ocean, which is acidifying the ocean. It, they're chopping down rainforests in places like Brazil to make cow pastures. You know, the list goes on and on and on of why, why it's bad, like the amount of water a cow needs to, to grow and, and the amount of food that they need and so on and so forth. Like we, we, like a lot of people say we, we're not going to be able to sustain the population and it's like, well, no, not if we are operating at the way we're operating now, but if we, if we change our perspective and, and we all learn to eat less meat, um, then yeah, it's totally doable. And, uh, and the planet's going to benefit. I mean, you know, another crazy stat that most people don't know about is 40% of the ocean's reef, coral reefs have died in the last 40 years, you know, and that's because the ocean is acidifying and the cattle industry is a big part of that. So, you know, I'm gonna, now I'm going to have someone who listens to this call me out when they see me eating a burger or somewhere, but... It's, it's, uh, I'm not trying to tell everyone to be vegetarian because I'm not going to be either, but, you know, but I used to eat meat, you know, almost three courses a day 
yep. or at, at least twice a day. And now, uh, you know, maybe so, a lot of days I won't eat it at all, or maybe just once, or you know, or and if I'm gonna have beef, it's like a rare treat instead of you know, like I, I've had one steak probably in the last year, yeah. you know, um, but. And it was a delicious treat, you know, and so, or maybe two, I guess, in the last year, now that I think about it, two special occasions, you know, and, and, and that's great. It's a special treat. And, um, and that's what I try to encourage people to do more of is just, you know, is, is stop being so damn selfish and, and think about, you know, think about beyond your own existence because, um, you know, there's a whole world out there of, of other living beings and animals and and a future world that uh that all the next generation of animals and beings are going to need to grow up into and and it's pretty selfish for us to just take 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 and and not leave anything else for for anyone else or anything else so yeah totally um like you said we need to start making these adjustments and uh like if you think of it as like we're taking off in a plane right now, if we're one degree off in our uh, trajectory, you know, in by the end of our flight, we're going to be thousands of miles off our target. But if we're, you know, if we're on the trajectory and we start making all these little, these little changes, they'll start to add up and they'll start to course correct us back towards a place where our future generations can not only survive but thrive and i really do think that technology is going to be one of the things that leads us there and part of that technology development is going to be taking care of our own bodies so that our brains are working properly so that we can you know we can use our mm -hmm. our brains for the fullest potential so that we can come up with these technologies and we can do these things you know right because right now, like right now, a lot of us are just poisoning our brains. You know, we're feeding our brains sugar and um, and all these like really processed foods. And um, you, you know, your brain is a is a living part of you, and it needs nutrition to operate at a full state. And and uh, and with the crap that we're feeding ourselves in this day and age, it's it's no wonder there's so many damn stupid people out there. <laughs> And, uh, you know, and somehow they somehow run, run countries and, you know, I'm not going to name names, but, you know, um, I think, I think it's all going to kind of, a lot of things are going to work themselves out just through, because that's just going to be like the economic driver and, and it's, it's just going to be the, the easy no brainer thing. But, but some things people are going to have to change and they're going to have to teach their children, uh, differently and, and they're going to have to think, uh, differently than they have for the last however many years they've been on this earth. And, uh, and it's easy, you know, I've, I've done it. Um, I've done it to a lot of, a lot of my, um, parts of my life and, and you know what, I'm happier and healthier for it. So, um, why can't we all, you know? Yeah, totally. And like when you start looking it as, uh, you know, it's, there's like a good type of selfishness and a bad type of selfishness, like taking care of yourself. If you're not taking care of yourself, if you're not taking care of your body, you can't actually go out and take care of other people. And I feel like so many people in the world do have these huge hearts. They do want to take care of the world, but they don't start with themselves. And so if you don't, you know, if you don't start with yourself, if you don't take the time to take care of yourself and to exercise and to, um, you know, actively work on your health, you, you're essentially being selfish with the rest of the world because you're, you're putting your burdens on the rest of society through, you know, through uh, the surgeries or through, you know, by not taking care of yourself, you're really, you know, it, it becomes detrimental to society. Yeah, and, it, and it's, a, it's a mental health thing too, right? Like a lot of people... Yeah. A lot of people don't realize that all this stuff kind of leads back to a, a mental health thing as well. And um, if you're unhappy, um, you're probably unhealthy. Yeah. And they they are very much linked together. You know, an active 
well-nourished, uh, healthy life is a happy life. And, um, and you know, I, I have friends that have dealt with depression and, and that have been in a hard or bad mental state and, and they're unhealthy at the same time. You know, they're, they're not taking care of their body um, and their mind is, is suffering from it. And so it, it's all linked and, and, you know, and it's, and, you know, why do I have an opinion on all this? I'm a skier. Why does anyone care? Well, this all affects winter basically yeah. is what it totally. comes down to. And that's why, you know, that's the number one reason, reason why I've become passionate about, um, the environment. I mean, there's a lot of other reasons I, you know, I've, I'm very much connected to nature type person and I love the outdoors and I love animals. I, I often say that I, you know, I love animals more than I love people because, you know, they they don't have any um, cruel intentions and and uh, and they're not destroying the world like we are. They're just living in it. Um, and you know, and so there's all those things obviously that I love. But first and foremost, I love skiing pow. I love skiing <laughs> deep pow. I love you know the fact that I live in a in a mountain area that has glaciers all year round. Uh, and we have fresh, beautiful drinking water and, you know, it's the whole circle of life and we humans are messing up that circle of life. And it's, it's really amazing to me how many people I talk to about this that have no idea and think it's all just some sort of conspiracy theory. And it's like the number one thing you got to say to these people is, is like, listen, we trust scientists to put a man on the moon. We trust scientists to come up with the medicines that keep us healthy. We trust scientists for all these things in our day-to-day -day lives, and yet we don't trust them when 98% of the scientists on this planet are telling us that we are fucking it up, and somehow we're not going to believe that just because it's inconvenient for our day-to-day -day life and we don't want to feel guilty about it and we don't want to think about it and we don't want to deal with it so we choose not to believe them on this aspect and it's you know that's just the i don't know it's just it's just like the, the cop-out way to think about things you know and, and I, I feel like people that that don't trust in in what the scientists are telling us right now they just don't want to believe it because they just want to go along with their day-to-day -day life and you know, a lot of them are like, well, it's not going to affect me in my life. It'll be the future generations. And, and to me, that's bullshit, too. You know, it's yep. it's it's completely unfair. Um, and um, and we should and nobody has the right to to think that way in my mind or, and, and live that way. So we all have to have some sort of level of responsibility. And I'm not sitting here saying that I'm fucking perfect either. You know, no. I mean, you know, there's there's many more things that I want and need to do in my life to to improve but but being conscious of it on a day-to-day -day basis and and making an effort and if we if this seven billion of us on this planet went and tried to do that then it would be a much different place now mind you many billions of those people are poor yep. but the poor people are having far less of an impact than the rich yep. it's the rich that are having the biggest impact and, and and they're the ones that need to change and, and stop being so selfish. So, and, and, you know, I consider myself in that category, you know, like I'm in the upper 1% or 5% of the world's population. You know, I'm, I'm by no means rich of what you would consider a rich person. But if you look at the global population, then heck yeah, I am. Yeah. And, um, and, it's, and it's our responsibility, us people that live in the first world that, uh, that you know, consume so much of the natural resources and and pollutes uh so much of the pollution that goes into the world we we're the ones that need to take responsibility so yeah totally i feel like um capitalism has given us uh too many choices and now with those too many choices we have become like just you know obese because we have you know we have all of these options or options that were given to us and it's maybe not choices because i think a lot of the people just kind of are like a, a horse to water with uh with that but i i really see the millennial generation starting um 
for purpose businesses. And I see more and more people in my generation starting these businesses that are for purpose that really are meant to impact the world. And it's like a, it's like a social capitalism where it's still you, you know, the, the consumers are driving the business, but people are using their dollars to influence the um, economic landscape which allows the the businesses that are doing the for purpose work that are doing the uh, the stuff that is helping us as society, helping the environment, helping whatever causes they are, that those businesses are really going to be the driving businesses and this social capitalism is going to come in as a new form of government, not because uh, we vote, well, because we voted in with our dollars, not because we vote it, we vote some person in. It's just going to be, you know, at this point, there's, uh, you know, a limited number of people who are at the top. And if we all start using our dollars to change the economic landscape to these for purpose businesses, then all of a sudden, they're not going to have the power. If we all stop going to McDonald's because they're supporting the agriculture industry um, and the beef industry and, and they're you know, such huge proponents for it, then, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you, man. And, I mean, you know, without getting too political here, I mean, capitalism is a flawed system, right? Yep. Um, not, I'm not saying socialism is perfect either, and I'm not saying communism is perfect either, but there's got to be some sort of new system in the future moving forward that's, that's a blend of, of all, everything that's out there right now. Because right now, in the, in the capitalist system, we basically have huge corporations that own our government. And so we live in this, we live in this society where there's this illusion of choice like the because we're going out and voting but whoever we're voting for is owned by these huge corporations yep. and and we don't we're, we're not actually living in a democracy like we want it to be you know and uh and so yeah there definitely needs to be a change on on uh, on that land whole landscape and i agree with you i think like future generations there is a lot of positivity to to look at uh, when I'm when I'm looking at younger generations of people coming up and what they're doing uh, and and the types of businesses they're starting and uh, and their mindset, you know, they're growing up in in a world that's uh, that's not perfect and that um, you know it's not the 50s anymore where you know you don't have to think about any of this shit. There is there is a lot going on that we have to think about and that we have to consider and. Um, and we all have to have that bit of responsibility. And yeah, hopefully with that, our money drives the change that we so desperately need. And, uh, and you know, however many years down the road, we'll have a, a different system that's working for us a lot better. Yeah, totally. I think, um, you know, what I hope to see from Generation Z, I think is what they're being called, the generation after millennials, people born in 2000 or later right now. Uh, what I really hope we see from them is that they demand transparency and they demand, um, yeah, full disclosure on what is happening within businesses and yeah. so that they really can use their dollars to support the companies that are out there making a difference. And yeah. I don't think, you know, they are going to be the most powerful generation at some point. And they are going yeah. to have the full uh, capabilities to change the economic landscape. And so that's something that I would really encourage people, you know, uh, at no matter what age, but especially kids, to really demand that transparency from companies and really, uh, you know, demand that they see exactly what they're doing, the companies are doing to help change the world as well as you know what what resources they're using and um yeah i that's something that i really hope to see from the younger generation no for sure because we we live in an information age now right and um there's a lot people have a lot more access to information a lot easier there is a lot of false information out there as well yep. but if you know what you're looking for and you and you know how to uh weed through all that false information there you know, you can be a very well-informed person this day and age um, just by picking up your phone. 
But yeah, when you look at the developing world, I was watching a TED talk and they say like, you know, there's going to be another th three billion people with smartphones um, in the next uh, 20 years or not even 15 years by 2030. Yep. And that's a lot more people that have access to information that right now don't have any information about what's going on in the world. And, um, and I think with, with that many well-informed human beings on the planet, uh, you, we're, we're bound to see, um, a change. And, and, you know, if, if the people in power won't change, then I think the people that aren't in power will rise up and demand it. So, um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting, uh, time that we live in. And I think it's, it's a really cool time that we live in. And, um, and you know, it's cool to be part of it. And, uh, and hopefully we can all be on the on the side of, of change and and you know driving uh, our societies towards uh, you know a more positive future that uh, future generations like if I have children or you know my my siblings children or whoever it may be um, have have a better brighter future ahead. Yeah, with full full of skiing deep pow. Totally. <laughs> For everyone. <laughs> right. Which is really what we're talking about here. I mean, you know, this all affects how deep the powder is. <laughs> and uh, and that's what we're really getting at. So, yeah. Totally. And it, yeah, it's those moments that we live for. That's, you know, the whole reason why I even have been so exposed to the environmentalism aspect. And I think why a lot of the people that I talk to on these on this podcast, like Angel Collinson and Lexi DuPont and all them, you know, it's it's all been the love of deep pow and that feeling and those smiles and, you know, that stoke that you get from just floating down the mountain, man. So. There's nothing else like it in the world. It's you know to someone who doesn't ski or snowboard, it, it there's no point in even trying to explain it because <laughs> it's unexplainable. But it's it's one of the greatest feelings that uh, that we humans can can experience on on this planet. So yeah, I want I want uh, many many future generations to to also experience it. Yeah, definitely, and I think you know. If the more we voice our opinion, the more that we unify and the more that we we know, um, you know, I don't want to be divisive and create a, a war between, you know, two opinions. But the more that we can unify in ideals, even though some of them may be different, but, you know, um, j uh, like people who are scuba divers or people who have you know, you talked about the coral reefs. Um, I was in Belize a year and a half ago and, uh, you know, I saw it was the locals that were less respectful to the environment than the visitors. And I think that speaks to that, um, lack of information, lack of access to information that you're talking about because, you know, the people that are traveling there obviously are more quote unquote worldly because they're traveling from, you know, somewhere else. Yeah. And uh, so one business, I have never talked about this uh, publicly like this uh, on the podcast, but one business that I want to start is uh, I want to incentivize people in third world countries starting in Belize to pick up plastic, educate them and incentivize it through paying them and then upcycle that plastic into polyester or um, clothing material and weave it in with bamboo and then create clothing or coats or, um, you know, whatever, whatever I can out of that. I'm not the most intelligent when it comes to all of the manufacturing aspects. It's more research that I want to do, but, you know, then I can incentivize, then I can educate and I can create a product that, um, brings to market these, these ideas, you know, for sure. You know, I think, I think we, you know, we have the power to fuck up the oceans and we have the power to, to fix them. Yep. It's, it's going to take time. Um, and, and like anything, you know, it's a lot easier to get fat than it is to get back in shape. Yep. Um, and you know, the ocean, the oceans are, are getting, you know, for lack of a better analogy, uh, they're getting fat right now. <laughs> we need to get them back in shape. And that's going to be a lot harder, but it's it's not not 
possible. You know, yeah. it's it's all doable, and there's a lot of things happening to that are positive. And, and hearing you say like, hey, you know, like this is a great business idea that I want, that's that's going to have a huge impact. And and you know, we need to we need more people with with education, and we need more open mindedness in this world. We need less people that just hate someone's opinion simply because their opinion is different than theirs. Yeah. You know, um, you know, having more of an open mind to hear everyone else's opinion and, and, you know, and take it for what it is, but, but understand that, that, uh, that we're not all right all the time, you know, and, and everyone out there has validity to what they believe in. And so you have to see the world through their eyes a little bit. Um, you know, there's a lot of crazy people too, and with not much validity. But but we also have to have open mind. When, you know, because without an open mind, um, you know, you get into this state that the U.S. is in right now, where it's just this super divided um, yeah. left or left or right world. And you know, if you're you know, it, it almost doesn't even matter what anyone says. If you're aligned with either the left or the right, like whatever said on that side, that's what you believe. And it's like, you know, like, no, I can't disagree with that because it's, it's who I align myself with. And it's like, it's bullshit. Like, why do we need to believe like everything that's on one side or the other? Why can't we meet in the middle? You know? Yeah. So, yeah. Like we, Inherently, we want community. We want to be loved. We want to be validated. But uh, you know, I I was just hearing that siren brings up some emotion for me because I was just half a mile away from what happened in Vegas, and you know, being so close to that situation, it obviously um, shows how fucked up the the u.s is right now how you know we're, we're talking about the, these um you know situations where uh mental illness is, is rampant and um there's been these huge debates immediately after about gun control and it's just been so polarizing and so divisive to society instead of for me i don't want to hear you know, I can respect the Second Amendment. I can respect people's right to carry guns. But for me right now, it doesn't need to be talked about. What needs to be talked about is how we can unify to support the victims of the situation. And it's not our time to air out the dirty laundry about our opinion and take sides and finding our team. It's our time to unify together. And for so. sure and i mean and there you know both sides of the argument are are very polarizing you know they're and like people who are on one side you know are you know get super upset at the other side and vice versa and and um yeah people need to come together a little bit more but they also need to have more of an open mind yep. because you know the, the bottom line is is like you know i i say this as a canadian but the u.s needs to look at itself and, and go why the heck are we the only country in the world where this is happening on a regular basis? Yeah. You know, and if there's and if mental health is running rampant due to, you know, poor nutrition being a big part of it, um, unhealthy people, unhealthy minds, and 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 yet you can go and buy an assault rifle for under a thousand bucks and 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 you know, modify it to shoot a thousand rounds a minute uh, for only a few dollars more there's something wrong with that whole picture and why do we need that in our society you know uh there's a lot of countries in the world where people don't have access to that and and everyone's happy and fine and i get it you know what if you have one of those guns they're super fun to shoot i've shot them in alaska they're really fun to shoot but you know what it goes back to the whole like non-selfish thing yep. where we need to think beyond ourselves and be less selfish and 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 realize that you know what like society has to be a little bit of a give and take and and we have to play as jim jeffries put it best <laughs> yes. to our lowest one percent and if our lowest one percent is mentally unstable crazy people then we need to make sure that they can't get access to war weapons. Yeah. And 
without getting into this argument too much, you know, I mean, there's, you know, there's the whole argument about Australia changed their gun laws and they haven't had a shooting since and so on and so forth. And I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I'm like super anti-gun because I have some, you know, um, and I have an open mind towards the people who are really pro-gun, but they also need to have an open mind to the fact that like, there's no need in our society when there's mentally unstable people running around that we should have access to war weapons. And, um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny that it's a debate. It's to me as an outsider looking in and it's, and it's wild to see the amount of emotion people have that are linked to it. And, and, you know, again, like Jim Jeffries said, you know, like people say they can't, you can't change the second amendment. Well, Time to get a fucking dictionary because it's an amendment. <laughs> right. An amendment, you know, like if you can't change an amendment, then what what can you change? You know, that's the whole definition of it is is that it can be changed. And, you know, it's the whole idea of like prohibition used to be in the Constitution. And people said, no, we like to fucking drink. And yeah. so they took prohibition out, you know, I mean. We have to, in society, understand that, like, you know, as our world ages and as our society evolves, we need to change with the times. And, you know, certain things that were made up or written down on a piece of paper for a nation to run all their laws by hundreds of years ago aren't necessarily going to work for the current state of where things are at and people need to understand that because when that was written when the constitution was written you couldn't buy an assault rifle that could shoot a thousand rounds a minute you could buy a musket (laughs) and by the time you reload that thing you're probably either going to be under arrest or or tackled you're not going to be as mad anymore (laughs) or something you know like so that we have to change as we evolve as a society. Otherwise we don't evolve as a society and we get left behind. And, um, and that's kind of, you know, I guess I could just leave it at that. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't want to, I'm sure I'm going to have people just ripping me apart about like this or that or the other thing, but you know what? I, I have an open mind. So rip away and, and have a good time with it because you know what? I'll gladly hear your argument, but yep. what I just said is true, and you know it. And if you're pissed off about why I, what I just said, then it's because you know it's true, yep. and yep. that's why you're pissed off. So, um, you know, there's there's if you're arguing anything I've just said, then I'm sorry. You need to check yourself because you're only angry at me because you know it's true. Yeah, totally, man. And I I really respect you for. Um, voicing your opinion especially you know on this platform when it, it's going to be a public thing and um you know from an outsider's perspective it's nice to hear uh what you think because you know living in the midst of it we uh it's <clears throat> it's just a different perspective but i i you know i tend to share and hold those same opinions and um you know, as humans, one of the things why we have become the, the superior, um, animals on the planet is because we have these genes that are adaptogenic genes. And that's what, that is our forte is to adapt. And now we're at a point where it's too quote unquote uncomfortable for us to adapt and for us to make those changes, whether it's in meat, whether it's our second amendment rights or, or whatever it is, but really that's what we're the best at. And we're not getting our, giving ourselves credit as the human species, as a human race, that we are amazing at changing. And, you know, if we can give ourselves that credit and if we can stop trying to find the team and hold so dearly to the ideals that that team uh, creates and if we can just realize that we can have an open mind and we can adapt and that we can uh, find these alternative solutions to the problem 
we're going to be so much better off in society and we're going to be so much happier because we're going to be eating better because we're going to be, you know, it's like 90% of serotonin or something like that is made in the gut. So, you know, having these things, you talked about depression earlier. A year ago, I was severely depressed. I walked out of a workout and I literally, I wanted to fucking kill myself and I had no clue why. But looking back at it, I was eating terribly, I was eating tons of sugar, and I was uh, drinking alcohol almost every day, and I wasn't taking care of my body, and the my dreams and who, the way that I was living were so far vastly different that, uh, you know, the I and I was just, it wasn't aligned, and so I was, you know... Um, I was fucking depressed and I wasn't, I wasn't living in, you know, it it might be a little hippie, but living in my true purpose or living in my true, you know, in my, uh, yeah, in my true purpose. And so, um, you know, taking those things out, I've adapted. Yeah. And, and, and I don't think it's, I don't think it's, I don't think it's hippie at all to, to, you know, to live healthy, you know, and, and people will, you know, people might say that, but. It, it's complete BS, you know, it's, um, you know, a healthy body is a healthy mind, like I said before, and, and I'm, and I'm happy to hear that you're, um, in a better place now and, and that you're living a healthier life and therefore have a healthier mindset. And, um, and, but you know, yet we have this society that's living on really bad food and sugar and it's, there's a lot of mental illness and, and yet, in that same society, there's access to war weapons, yep. and the, the that can't work. It, it's never going to work. There's never going to be a a place where that works. And, um, you know, I go out and shoot shotguns at clay pigeons with my buddies, and it's super fun, and we have a great time. But you know, you can't buy war weapons in Canada. And we don't have these shootings, you know, and and it's the same for a lot of the developed world, you know, Um, and, you know, everyone in the States is is also very as as most of us are in the developed world. We're all, you know, fearful of terrorism. You know, it's something that um, that is part of our society, whether we like it or not, it's out there and, you know, you're giving them access to war weapons. You know, it's, it's, it's like, to me, it's a no brainer. Um, it's just, it's, it's, you know, let's, let's drop the selfishness. It's like, yeah, they're super fun guns to shoot, but like, is it really worth all these lives? You know, and, and if you lost a loved one in a shooting like this, would you take back all those days of shooting your assault rifle at the range, um, for that person? You know, and and that's how people need to start to think and they need to, you know, they need to lose their emotional connection that they have with these sorts of things because there's a lot of emotion there and there's a lot like, you know, there's a heavy emotional connection with like with that people have with this. And it's like, you know, drop your emotional connection with it. It's not that big of a deal. You know, it's like have an emotional connection to real things like people you love, not materialistic or weird things like assault weapons, you know, and, and it's, um, to me, it's, it's, it's just a really strange thing. And, and I know to a lot of the developed world that is outside of the U S we're all just going, what the heck is going on? Like, how is this still a debate and how, and, and yet, you know, I, I flick on Facebook, which I try not to do these days cause I don't really like Facebook. Yep. Um, cause there's so much crap on there. But I flick it on and it's just loaded with these arguments about guns and these pro-gun people and these anti-gun people. And they're just going back and forth with all this hatred. And I mean, is that helping anything? No. But can we have a civilized conversation about it? And can we all drop our emotional connection with it and just get real? You know, um, you know, it's it's tragic, man. Like it's it's so freaking I had friends down in Vegas, too, that were a block away and I'm. So thankful that uh, that they're all good, you know. And it's 
it's just it's so tragic that these things need to still happen and that and that nothing changes and nothing seems like it's ever going to change because um, because you know you have this super wealthy organization called the NRA that's paying lobbyists a ton of money in government and those people that are getting paid that ton of money are going to fight tooth and nail to convince everyone else that it is taking away their freedom. You know what? And it's like, all right, you know what? I go to Switzerland, I can go base jumping. That's me taking my own life into my own hands. Yep. I can go base jumping and it's fully legal. I go to this US and I can't do that, <laughs> but I can go buy an assault rifle. Like get your freedoms in check. Get your like, you know, it's like what what defines freedom? To right. me, it's being able to choose what I do with my own life, not what I, how I take someone else's, or or you know the ability to take someone else's, and like, and and yet somehow we're all brainwashed into thinking that like you know it's taking away your freedoms, and and it's you know it's it's fucking with the constitution, it, you know it's like the constitution, like I mentioned, has been messed with before, and it should change. It yeah. needs to evolve for a country to evolve. Yep. And if a country doesn't evolve, they get taken over by other countries like China. Right. You know, which is investing in clean energy and <laughs> not having mass shootings every day. Yeah. Or every month or whatever whatever the heck it is, every month or couple months or year or whatever it is. You know? Totally. If there was an active shooter on an Air Force base uh, two days before the Vegas thing happened. It's happening yeah. more and more and more often. And, yeah, uh, and and as you know, as the population grows and becomes even more unhealthy and and mentally unhealthy, it's it's gonna get worse. It's never gonna go away. There's never, there's no solution other than getting rid of them. Yeah. And and in Canada, we have a lot of guns per capita. We everyone owns guns, but we either hunt with them or we go shoot clay pigeons with them. Yep. And, you know, um, and it, you know, to get a gun on the black market, like the one that, like the ones that were used in Vegas is like, you know, 30 or 40 grand. And, you know, some crazy person that, uh, wants to go kill a bunch of people probably doesn't have 30 or 40 grand kick, kicking around their bank account. And if they do, they're probably not going to go out and do that because they probably got their shit together and um, they're probably not mentally unstable and thinking about killing dozens of people, yeah. you know. So and that's the other argument is that people will just say like, oh, yeah, we'll go. They'll just get them on the black market. Well, good luck. You know, you're not going to you're not going to buy that assault rifle that you can get at Walmart for under a thousand dollars. Uh, on the black market for less than 30 or 40 grand. So yep. um, it's, a, it's, a, it's another BS argument. And, um, you know, chime in all the haters. You can send me all the hate mail you want. You know I'm right. So let's move on from this whole one. Yeah, <laughs> totally. And we got to, you know, like terrorism will exist uh, inside of our country or outside of our country until we become open-minded enough to accept other people's opinions and then have a mature conversation about it. And that's, you know, that's the bottom line, I think. Yeah, we also have to have an open mind about, you know, Canada has, Canada has been at, uh, like, I'm a Canadian. We've been at the same wars with you guys in the Middle East. And let's, let's be real about what we're doing over there. We're not fixing anything. No. For every terrorist we kill, we kill 50-some other innocent people. We're breeding hatred over there and we're creating this mess. You know, we're not fixing it. You know, there's, there, we're never going to fix um, violence with violence. Yeah. It's never going to work. You're, you're never, and, and it's like, it's like we all consider ourselves to be like this grown society of like intelligent beings, but we're acting like apes. Yeah. We're acting like the chimpanzees we evolved from. We're acting like children because we just fight evilness with more evilness. And it, and it perpetuates it for eternity. 
You know, yeah. if you look at like, what's going on in Israel and Palestine, there, it's never going to end if the violence doesn't end. Yeah. They're, it's it's going to go on. It's been going on forever. And it's going to continue to go on forever because no one's willing to just lay down arms yeah. and and stop the fighting. And and we in the first world and as a, as a civilized society, we need to realize that like we're never going to get rid of terrorism through killing them. No, you know, let's and and let's spend all those billions of dollars on protecting ourselves from them. And we'll be way better off, and totally. we won't be breeding hatred, you know. And it's we're just we're just yeah we're we're like children. We you know we think we're a civilized society of human beings, and but we're just like we're like we're barely evolved monkeys. Like we're just acting like like the chimpanzees you see that kill their neighbors because they you know want to take over or whatever. You know it's it's. And we're we're just animals. Like it's we're not we're not as civilized as we think we are, and we're not as smart as we think we are until we can figure out that the only way to fix all this shit is love, and and that's the only thing we're meant as human beings. If there is a higher creator, I'm not a religious person, but um, you know, if the, if there is a purpose and a meaning to this life, it's love. Yeah, and um, perpetuating hatred and and trying to you know fight hate with hate with more hate and and trying to you know fight back with weapons it's never going to work it's just going to go on forever and it's only going to get worse so totally what do you recommend that you and i can do you know what what do you and i want to commit to doing tomorrow to make the world a better place what what's something you know I, when I was in the airport, anyone that I saw that was distraught on Monday morning uh, coming back, I went up to them and I said, hey, I know I'm a stranger, but can I offer a hug or a shoulder to cry on or at least my ears if you need to talk about anything? And um, Yeah, I mean, and that's it, man. That's exactly it. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm you and I aren't going to do anything to persuade our governments to stop fighting needless wars, um, but we can spread love and and that's what we all should be trying to do as human beings and you know if if everyone gets on board with that it's it's the same as climate change we can fix this issue um if if everyone makes an effort to to just love one another more and and not be so judgmental of everyone around you and and not um and not you know and not be so, you know, trying to compete with everyone around you. I think everyone's just, you know, trying to one up every, their neighbors or whatever it may be. We're all just, we all just need to love each other and help each other and support each other. You know, we're, I'm really lucky um, where I live is I have this massive network of friends here in the, in the Sea to Sky Corridor in the Squamish to Pemberton Whistler area. We have this huge network of friends and we all genuinely love each other and we all think of each other as as family and we're in the hundreds and we do things together and it's powerful and and we can achieve anything together as a unit because we're not trying to compete against one another and we're not trying to one up one another and we're not trying to you know outdo one another we're, we're only trying to help one another and uplift one each other and and you know it's it's a beautiful thing man it's if if society operated like my little bubble that i have here um we would be living in a pretty utopic world for sure totally um how did how did you find those people how did you find your tribe your crew what was yeah um i think it's you know i think it's just being that type of person you yeah. know i think it's you know, um, you're going to gravitate, gravitate towards, uh, the, the type of people that, that you want to be around and, um, and they're going to gravitate, gravitate towards you too. And especially if you're the type of person that, uh, that, you know, lifts them up and, you know, I do, I do some, um, you know, kind of inspirational talks for, for, uh, for kids at some of these camps. And, and one of the main things I tell them is, 
is, you know, in this life, be a team player. Don't try and outdo the person next to you. Lift them up. Help them succeed, and then you will succeed. Yeah. And, you know, this is how we operate, you know, at TGR when we're, you know, Teton Gravity Research. This is – we're a family, and this is why TGR has been successful for so many years and why they will continue to be successful is yeah. because we all work as teammates. I'm not trying to get a better segment than Angel – no. I'm trying to make sure that she crushes it and she's trying to make sure that I crush it and so that we all crush it as a team so that when the movie comes out, it's the best movie it can be and therefore we all succeed as yeah. a team and we all lift each other up. And that's how we need to operate as a society and that's how you know I, my circle of friends and I operate and, and I think it's like through being that type of person, you're gonna, people are going to gravitate towards you. You know, yeah. if, if you're the type of person that, that wants the people up around you and, and, and wants to, you know, help the people around you succeed, then more and more people are going to gravitate towards you and you're going to find that you have a lot of friends all of a sudden and a lot of people who genuinely care and love you, you know, care for you and love you. And, and, and it's not fake and it's not artificial, it's real. And, and, and they're willing to help you in times of need and they're there for you, and uh, and you're there for them. And if we all were more like that in society instead of, you know, hating thy neighbor just because, you know, whatever, they're different than us or, you know, we don't see eye to eye or whatever it may be. Like, try and pick each other up, you know, like, and we would all be better off. And it sure works, you know, for me in my life. And then that's one of the things I try and teach the youth is, like, is is do not be a selfish person like pick all those up people up around you you know if if someone has a better opportunity to succeed at something than you then give them that opportunity you know let's say you're on a team together if they have a better chance at scoring a goal than you do pass them the freaking ball yeah you know don't be selfish and that's how you should operate in life yeah and and like I say, if, if you operate like that, then you're going to, you know, you're going to find that you're going to have a much happier existence and you're going to have a lot of people that love and care about you. Totally. One of my favorite quotes that I heard recently is if you give enough people what they want, you'll have exactly what you want. And Exactly. It's, it's the key to manifestation. Totally. You know, so many people want to wonder how they can get where they want to be in life. And the key to manifesting anything you want in life is to like pick up all those around you and make anyone around you that you work with or that you you know socialize with or or anything that you even you know meet pick them up because you never know what that person is going to be able to do for you down the road that's going to all of a sudden manifest into exactly where you want to be in life and and that's the key you know and I think that's a big reason of how I got to where I am today is, is being that type of person. Um, you know, like I say, there's, there's a lot of skiers out there with talent that, um, that never got to where I am or, or, you know, never made it or, or never got, or, or never were as successful. And, and it's maybe because they, they didn't look at life in the, in the same way and they were just trying to compete with everyone around them. And, um, and, you know, things didn't line up for them because of that. Yeah, totally, man. I can attest your personality is one of the biggest personalities I've been around, but not because of egotism, because of love and passion. And it's something, you know, it's one of the reasons why I was so attracted to befriending you when we were down in Chile was because you just had this bigger-than-life personality in the sense of just passion and love and i know that you you have touched so many people's lives along the way and like it probably was something that you never even um <clears throat> thought about uh when you were doing it or that you probably have thought about since like our interactions but i have such fond memories of it and it, you know it's it's one of those things that's just yeah well that's that's you know i really appreciate you saying that by the way and and the feelings are mutual, um, but you know, f for me, it, it's 
it, it just become it, it's one of those things that like yes you always have to work on it you know um like if you ever read the book the four agreements mm-hmm. totally yeah like it's it's a book i encourage everyone to read and it's something that i don't have dialed in my life at all no. um but i'm always trying to work on um and and some things become start to become second nature and and that's kind of you know for me has always been one of those ones that was the easiest second nature is just is to just treat everyone around me with with respect and love and and give everyone the benefit of the doubt um and and get to know them and and uh and understand that um that everyone around you is 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 a person too and and you know deal with all the sort of same things that you deal with in life and and deserve you know to be treated in the same way that you want to be treated and if you you know, it's, it's, again, it's kind of cliche, but if you go through life like that, you're going to, you're going to succeed. You know, there, there's, there's no way you won't succeed if, if you go through life like that and, uh, and it'll be rich and full of friends and, and, and people that love you. So, um, yeah, I, I encourage people to, to really, you know, think beyond yourself in this world and, and then all of a sudden everything's going to line up for you as a person and, uh, and, you know, the world will all fall into place. But if you're fighting the world and if you're competing with everyone around you, it's probably never going to work out. And and nothing will ever fall into place. And you'll sit there wondering why and you'll get angry and, and bitter and it'll it'll become it'll, – it's like a snowball effect, you know, in the wrong direction. Yep. Um, just as it can be a snowball effect in the right direction – it can go the other way, you know. You can find yourself um, snowballing in the wrong direction if 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 you're if you're not treating everyone around you the way they that you should be, and and uh, nothing will manifest. Totally, totally, man. Um, I was gonna ask you uh, for like one piece of advice or encouragement to leave people with, but I think, man, that is like so powerful right there. I don't know if you have. Um, you know, we've been on the call for an hour and a half. I feel like I could talk for hours with you. Um, and maybe we could do another. No, for interview. sure. Me too. Maybe we can do another yeah, and, interview. And we, and I'd, I'd be down. Totally. Yeah, I'd be down to do another interview another time. We can touch on some more things. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I guess if, like I mentioned before, if 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 I was to leave anyone with, with any final thought, and it's it's not my saying. I didn't create the saying, but it's one that I really aligns with me. And it's doubt kills more dreams than failure ever will. And um, if you doubt yourself, you'll, you're you're going to crush your dreams um, before they even happen. But if you try and fail, at least you know you tried and you failed, and eventually you'll find success. And, uh, and I really encourage people to live, live and well, die is not the wrong word, but, but live by those words and, uh, and life will work out pretty good for you. Well, there you have it, folks. I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. Don't forget to check out our sponsors, Northwest Tech and Organifi. If you enjoyed the podcast, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. We'll be doing this weekly. And if you'd like to check out my free ebook about becoming a better skier, check out academyofskiing.com. Thanks for tuning in. And I almost forgot a huge shout out to Toy Box, who did the music that you hear in the background. If you like what you're hearing, go check him out at soundcloud.com slash toy underscore box or check out the show notes for a link. Adios, guys, and happy shredding. <laughs>